things, what we're doing actually is we're reinforcing what happened, say, before to us. Say, say some sort of trauma happened to us in the past, and we want to, say, use the meditation practice, use the Dhamma practice to, to quote unquote, work through it. We have to be careful that when we're recollecting these, these things that may have happened to us in the past, that we're not actually just reinforcing the, uh, the emotion, the, uh, the negative emotions, which are uh, linked with that particular experience in the past. So there's a teaching I, I love to talk about, which is of uh, uh, a great Thai nun, a Meichi meditation master named Meichi Gao. And she was a disciple of both Ajahn Man and Ajahn Mahabua. More later on, Ajahn Mahabua was her main teacher, but she met Ajahn Man when she was a little girl. And um, she, she talks about this and she said, uh, just turn, turn your mind away from the past and move on, come back into the present. It's not about necessarily, uh, you know, we don't want to look at it too much. And she said, it's like when you get up in the morning and you recollect all the injustices that have been done to you in the, in the past, it's like, it's like you're, it's like there's smoldering embers there that are, that are smoldering and they're still kind of warm and they've been sitting next to you while you're sleeping and you wake up in the morning and you, and you, you fan them, you fan those smoldering embers and you get them burning again. And you, and that's, and then as we wake up and we, in a way we reconstruct our sense of self every, every day. And we're always doing that. And it's a burden. We're, it's a big burden, but we're always doing it. And there's something compelling us to do it. And so she said, it's like you wake up in the morning. It's like a ritual. It's, it's like you're, it's like the morning puja that everybody does. The morning puja that everybody does is, is, is fanning the smoldering embers of our past and then constructing that sense of self. And so what we want to be doing is like the theme, like deconstructing the human experience. So the deconstructing, looking into it. And that's, um, in a way, that's that's actually very, very simple to do. It, it just comes back to meditation. In the Thai forest tradition, we use the word butho. And when we use the word butho, it's just coming back to that meditation word. So instead of waking up in the morning and fanning the embers of our past, we can we can train ourselves to wake up in the morning and say butho, 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 butho. Yeah, right when we wake up, first thing when we wake up, it's just butho, 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 butho. When we wake up, then that's the first thing we do. And then it's it's wide open. I mean, there's uh, where we really free ourselves because you know, it's, we hem ourselves in, it's, we have to see the way we hem ourselves in with that constructing the, the sense of self, um, not just the identification with the five khandas, the form, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness. So it's not just that, but it's also, it's also the way we construct, it's like a mental edifice that we construct and we hem ourselves in with that, you know. So, for example, um, if I have a particular, uh, say, like um, right now, like with with the election, it's like a great time for insight. Uh, from my perspective, it's a great time for insight because it can highlight our sense of our sense of identification, perhaps with a political party. And so, because we because we have that sense of identification and we've constructed that around ourselves and um, surrounded ourselves with that. And everybody does this, so we don't have to judge ourselves by, by the fact that we've done this, but you know, everybody does this. And, uh, but because we've constructed that, we're in a very precarious position where if something doesn't go our way, then and uh, say whether we win or lose, whether the side we identify with wins or loses, then we're in a very precarious position because um, we're dependent on that construct 
in order to uh, our happiness. Our happiness and well-being is dependent on that. It's not independent. Um, it's not like the Mangala Sutta says, where it's uh, sorrowless, you know, unshakable. So with with Buddhist practice, and it's not like saying like uh, we need to um, make ourselves uh, into a whatever identify with the right thing. It's not about that, but it's learning how to see the process of identification and the process of investing in the conditioned world being a certain way. So this is super important and. It's more just, and in just seeing it, it starts to be dis deconstructed. So, so really what we're coming back to is mindfulness. And that's, that's the Satipatthana. So really what we're just coming back to is mindfulness and through, through seeing clearly, then we start to deconstruct our experience and thereby uh, free ourselves from that construct that we hem ourselves in with. Um, that being said, this is very, very difficult. I mean, this is on an ultimate level, this, this construct that we, that we have, this sense of uh, identification, the sense of self and the sense of investigating in the condition, investing in the conditioned world is the very engine on an ultimate sense. It's the very engine that drives rebirth according to the Buddhist teachings. And so it's no small thing to start to gain insight into it and, and uh, de deconstruct it. But we have to start somewhere. So, so we start where we are and we have mindfulness. And um, one of the, the Buddha said that one of the signs of a great person is knowing where you're at. So the first thing is like, where am I at right now? Like, do I feel good? Do I feel horrible? Uh, not judging yourself for how you feel, but just how do I feel right now? Is there pain in the body? Is there tension in the body? Is, uh, do I feel depressed or anxious? Do I feel bound up, contracted? Or is, is the mind expansive? And, or do I feel full of metta? and just in a very positive mental state. And again, it's not, it's not judging, or am I, do I feel judgmental? Even that, like, uh, do I have an unpleasant feeling associated with the judging mind or the criticizing mind? Um, so it's like taking stock of just where we're at and we go from there with, with mindfulness meditation. So, uh, Satipatthana, the foundations of mindfulness. This is super important. Uh, this also highlights the difference between like the world and the Dhamma. These are like two sides of the, the hand. And there's a worldly way of reacting to our experience and there's a, the Dhamma way of acting toward experience. And so Dhamma language, it's, it's kind of like learning a, a new language, the language of the heart, the language of experience. We all have it to a greater or lesser extent, but it's more like bringing it out, highlighting it. And the worldly way of reacting to experience is with either like or dislike. So that's either attraction or aversion. The Buddha talks about the, the three obscurations or the three poisons is greed, hatred, delusion. Uh, that's uh, loba, dosa, moha. But we can think of it in terms of a more uh, ultimate or subtle level in terms of attraction, aversion, and identification. We can think of greed, hatred, and delusion in that way. So um, on the level of the, the deep mind, we're always reacting to experience through, through when we experience something we like or a situation we like, it's bringing in, gathering towards uh, its attraction we're attracted to what we like. When, when we experience something we don't like or something unpleasant, then aversion, pushing away, getting distancing from, getting, getting away from. Uh, when we experience either of those things, then delusion can also come into play in terms of 
identification and investing in things being a certain way so that we can have a sense of, and when things are that way, the delusion is telling us that when, when we do get our way, when we do get what we want, and when we do get away from what we don't want, then I'll be at ease. Then I'll have a sense of well-being, finally. But it'll never really be that way. It's always like the, it's like the, um, what is it? The Greek myth of Oedipus or whatever, where it has like the peak and he's got the rock and it's always going one way or the other. And we're always going to be trying to fine tune things in that way. So, so with the Dhamma, we react in a bit of a different way with the Satipatthana. With the Satipatthana, rather than reacting with attraction or aversion, then we try to train ourselves in stages to react with knowing. So, so we train ourselves in stages to react with knowing. And we can always come back to knowing as well. So, so like if we're doing mindfulness meditation, for example, we can come to the, come into this idea of just knowing the, the feeling of the breath, the cool air coming in, the warm air exiting. That's like our anchor. And then when something arises in the mind, then say a, a, a good idea arises in the mind, then that's something good, so we like it. And so the liking comes into play and then we're attracted to it and we make much of it. And then the mind goes away from its object and it, it, it grabs onto the good idea and because of the liking and because of the attraction. And so then it's, oh, okay. Then when we come back to knowing, okay, knowing that the mind left its center because of, because of liking and because of a pleasant mental object arose, then we're, we're moving toward it. Or uh, something embarrassing and gross arises in the mind. Well, I'm a, I'm a mindfulness practitioner. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist. I'm, I'm a Buddhist monk. I can't, I can't. So get, get rid of that, get rid of it, you know, but then, okay. Mindfulness says that's aversion. That's, that's pushing away. So, so then uh, you get into this, this um, it's almost like it, it gets, this is about mental pur purification. It gets, it gets deeper in stages. So the mind will, the mind is, its nature is to have likes and dislikes and to, to push away and pull towards. But with mindfulness meditation, this is a very special condition that we're trying to put in place to, by stages, give the mind and give, eventually give the heart insight into the process of how the mind does that. When we start to gain insight into that, um, into that process, it'll, it'll be able to come back to a sense of centeredness and balance uh, much, much quicker. We'll start, and this is also when it comes into like the Four Noble Truths. So like the first Noble Truth being Dukkha, there is Dukkha. And uh, get into the etymology of the word dukkha a bit. I know uh, Ajahn Amaro likes to talk about this, and I also like to talk about it. And this is where the dukkha, on an in an etymological sense, means off kilter or like out of center, not quite right. Um, it doesn't just mean suffering. So uh, the the ka. The ka is the center of, of a wheel, like where the axle goes. So that's the ka, K-H-A. So that's the where the axle goes in the wheel. And when, when the wheel turns perfectly and you can't tell it's turning, so like on a well-balanced car, say like the wheel turns perfectly, that's called su. So when when it when the ka is su, that's su ka. That's happiness. That's the word for happiness in Pali. That means the wheel is turning smoothly, perfectly, without wobbling. That's su ka. And then uh, when it's du, 
that means it's wobbling all over the place. You know, uh, it's uh, it's not centered. So the, there's something wrong with the the axle with the the point where it has to go in. So the wheel is then wobbling and bouncing around, and the the ride is bumpy and uncomfortable. And so that's du ka. That's when the ka is du. It's it's out of kilter. It's back. It's not quite right. Um, so in an etymological sense, yes, when we, when we're going for the light, when we're running because of our likes and dislikes, then there's dukkha. So we're, we're kind of, the mind is running around based on that. It, it wears us out. It's uncomfortable. It, it, it's painful and we keep doing it. And so that's dukkha. But when we see with mindfulness, we see the dukkha, we see that it's out of kilter. Then, then uh, when a when a wheel gets serviced, so like um, I'll use a bike tire as maybe a better analogy. You call it truing. So when you true a wheel, then you true it up by looking at where it's out of whack. Maybe you have to like fix the axle or like put it on a lathe and sand it down and make it perfect and keep checking it. And, or if it's like a bike tire, you, you tighten each spoke. And when you tighten each spoke perfectly, then, then we true the wheel. And so we can't get the wheel true just by, just by sitting in mindfulness meditation. Um, there are some things we need to adjust. So, what we might discover in in mindfulness meditation, there's there's might be remorse, regret, uh, things in the mind which keep arising and don't actually seem to go away. So, no matter how much mindfulness meditation we do, there's there might be like a nagging problem or thing or trauma in the mind that that doesn't just stop. It it keeps coming up. There's something there. There's there's karma. That keeps coming up so and, and we all have this so that's dukkha so how do we how do we true it up and then this is where the path comes into play so for example if you think of like uh, remorse for example uh, why does that keep coming up if say we have regret remorse or uh, sadness or um, some something we can't explain, but it just emotionally on a very deep level it comes up and it affects us physically as well. So like things like depression that affect us physically. And so uh, it's kind of interesting too, as a contemplation, like as an aside, as a contemplation of the power of the mind that something like thought and perception, these things that are immaterial, according to the Buddhist teachings have a physical effect on us. These things that are immaterial have a physical effect on us. They're so powerful and yet they're, they're, they're immaterial. So why is that? So then that naturally brings us to sila. Sila is the, the virtue, the precepts, this is the conduct, right conduct. That's when we're starting starting to true those different spokes of the wheel, and so true our conduct. We're truing up our conduct. This is part and parcel of meditation. It's it's so important for the meditation. So without living a life of integrity and, and proper conduct, then the meditation there's always going to be that those things that come up, and the mindfulness isn't going to be strong enough to be able to unwind or untangle those knots in the heart. So we come back to proper conduct of, of starting with body and speech, and it, it goes both ways. Like we say body, speech, and mind, but body and speech, that's what we call Vinaya. So uh, proper conduct. From one perspective, also the entire path, all the way to liberation could be seen as proper conduct because uh, the entire path, according to what the Buddha called it, is Dhamma Vinaya. Vinaya is conduct of body and speech. 
Um, you can't break a precept except in maybe one or two very almost impossible cases. You can't break a precept with your mind alone. It has to be body or speech. So Vinaya is the training in body and speech. Dhamma is the mind conduct. So the Dhamma covers the, the mind training, the mind conduct, uh, the sense restraint. That's the higher conduct, the, uh, the mind restraint of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And again, and again, we say restraint, but that doesn't mean shutting these things off. Uh, sense restraint of the eye, for example, doesn't mean closing your eyes, but it means mindfulness. It means having mindfulness in terms of the eye. It means mindfulness in terms of the ear, mindfulness in terms of the nose, mindfulness in terms of the tongue, mindfulness in terms of the body, and as the sixth sense space, mindfulness in terms of the mind, the mental objects and those, the effect they have on us. And so those are the six sense doors, the six sense media doors where data is coming in from all around us all the time. And that's where we establish mindfulness. So when we say establishing mindfulness, it means it, it goes part and parcel with sense restraint. So when the Buddha talks about sense restraint, he talks about uh, the eyes, the, the eye sees forms and rather than giving light, rise to liking and disliking of the forms, then it's uh, not giving unwise attention to the signs and features of the forms that one is seeing. That's that's the definition of sense restraint of the eye. And, and it goes in with the ear and all the different sense bases. And that sense restraint, that uh, mindful, you could say mindful reflection, mindful relaxation, within the realm of these six sense bases that we're receiving data from all the time. That's the precursor to what we call samadhi. So without that restraint, and it, it's not a good word actually, I shouldn't be using the word restraint. It's the word in Pali is sangwara, which means I think a better translation is probably composure. So we could say the sense composure if we say sense composure, then that's a precursor to samadhi, which again is um, translated as concentration, but that's, I prefer the Thai translation is thang jai man, which is the firm establishing of the mind or the steadiness of the mind, because samadhi doesn't necessarily re refer to like a laser focus on a meditation object and exclusion to all else. But a samadhi, samadhi is more like a one-pointedness of purpose. So we're not, we're not like too scattered, too distracted, but yet we, we can, the mind can, is given a little bit of a pasture to roam in. Um, Ajahn Shah would talk about how to train the mind in samadhi. He would talk about, it's like, a, it's like you have a little bird, like a little sparrow and you're, you're holding it in your hand. So the mind is like this little bird. And when we, when we think, okay, I'm just gonna practice really, really hard and get enlightened. I'm gonna practice as hard as I can for a week and I'm gonna get enlightened. The Buddha said seven days of mindfulness, I'll get enlightened. And so we say, Budo, 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 Budo. And we try to go really, really tight. And that's like taking the little bird and crushing it. And so of course it dies. And the mind gets really, really tense. And then we end up, you know, just like overdoing it and, and uh, perhaps even giving up. And so that's like, that's like taking the little bird and crushing it to death. So that we find anybody who's tried that finds pretty quickly that it doesn't work. So uh, then there's the idea of like, well, you know, the Buddha said like everything is Dhamma and, and I'll just, you know, I don't need to practice meditation. It's meditation is just a, you know, it's just sila bhata baramasa. It's just attachment to rites and rituals. I don't have to bow. I don't have to chant. I don't have to practice any meditation. Just kind of like let everything be free and easy. You don't have to keep any precepts. That's, that's like the, you would open the hand completely and the little bird just flies away. So then the mind is just all over the place. So 
Lumpur Shah said, Ajahn Shah said that in the meditation, you hold it just right so that uh, there's this sense of just right. And the little bird, it can kind of hop around and move around. It can, it can shake around in the hand a little bit and it can stick its, stick its beak out a little bit from your fingers. And, um, but it's, it's comfortable. You're not, you're not hurting it. You're holding it and you're keeping it there, but you're not hurting it. And then uh, talking about like the Samadhi is then the little bird, it, it kind of tries to get out for a little while and you keep holding it there and then it just becomes comfortable and it falls asleep. And so, uh, so then that's, that's when the, the mind starts to settle. It just takes time. So what we're doing is we're holding the mind in mindfulness meditation where we're starting to see the likes and the dislikes and we're starting to see how the mind is moving. What is the mind moving toward? Uh, what can we do in our lives to facilitate the mind moving inward more and settling? And then we practice. We have to practice a lot, actually. It's good to meditate a lot. Um, without a lot of meditation, um, the mind won't really have a chance to settle if, if, we're, if we're too engaged with, with the world. The mind won't really have a chance to settle. That's why it's good to have periods of retreat and solitude. So then in the meditation, then the mind begins to settle and we, we develop that, that sense of mindful relaxation. <clears throat> so in, in the practice, this is very important because um, we, need, we need that peace to, to be able to have enough space to really see things clearly. If we're just reacting based on how we feel, you know, I feel that this is right. I feel that this is wrong. So like if we're reacting based on feeling, then we're not yet gaining insight into the process of how the mind and in, in the Thai forest tradition, they use the word heart a lot. They call it the heart because really, and I found this for myself, maybe it's different for others, but like I found the feeling center really is in the heart. Um, it's not, it's not in the, in the head. The head doesn't have, any, the brain doesn't actually have any nerves. The brain doesn't actually feel anything, but, but we do have this kind of heart center. And so, so that's where feeling seems to have like a physical, um, have like a physical basis. So when, when, the, when the mind and the heart starts to settle down with mindfulness meditation, then we can start to see things a bit more clearly and, and say, oh, okay interesting i was that's how i can deconstruct and free myself from from my experience from from the past that's how i can just start to gain a sense of ease and well-being and coming back to motivation too and and i briefly touched on in the very beginning was uh, the uh, really setting the motivation to develop a sense of ease and well-being that's also very important because if we're if we're just like meditating and like waiting for something to happen like oh, i've been meditating for years and nothing happened well it's like we we need to set the motivation so we we and we actually need to direct it in some ways according to dhamma we need to actually direct the mind to to cultivate mindfulness we need to remind ourselves to be mindful and to, to establish mindfulness we we do need to do a study of the teachings in order to kind of know what to do so it's not the fact, it's not the case that you meditate for long enough and then something happens. We also need to de be developing right view, right conduct. And then maybe something will happen. Uh, so uh, I, it looks like it might be time for questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Venerable. Um, we do have a few questions here, and um, I think, uh, Richard, if you would like to start off with the question, because they're, they seem to be coming maybe from you, or maybe you've collected them. No, I, I've started off asking a few questions to get us going. Uh, th thank you, Ajahn, so much. Um, could I ask you a question about Dukkha and Sukha, which was a really beautiful um, clarification. Is that to say that Sukha, you know, 
Dukkha and Sukha are obviously opposites in a sense. Um, is Sukha a cause for liberation? Is that the cause of liberation? You know, what is the cause of liberation? Because the way you've explained Sukha sounds like Sukha is being centered and Dukkha is being uncentered. Is that the cause of liberation? How would you answer that? Uh, very excellent question because, uh, yes, um, uh, sukha, sukha is, uh, is indispensable in terms of the cause, one of the precursors to liberation. So in the suttas, the Buddha talks about this progression of this natural progression of the path where starting with proper conduct leading to non-remorse, non-remorse leading to joy. Uh, joy leading to tranquility, which is uh, pasada. Joy is piti. So that's kind of like happiness, but it's more like excitement. It's Piti is what we normally think of as happiness, but it's not happiness in the way the Buddha is talking about it. It's not sukha. Piti is like, you know, uh, it can be thrilling. The thrill of of a pure, the idea of a pure mind, for example, would bring up piti. That leads to tranquility. Uh, tranquility is is that relaxation. Tranquility leads to sukha. So when when one is relaxed and without worries, then happiness arises. And and sukha, uh, the Buddha is talking about sukha. Uh, one quality of sukha is that we feel like. We could just it's it's deep inner contentment so we could just sit there forever so like when when you're you're sitting in meditation and sukha arises you might have this feeling like yeah i could just i could just sit here forever i have not a care in the world and this is just wonderful and but of course that's that's not liberation but it's indispensable and the buddha singles out sukha in that particular sutta, the Buddha singles out sukha by saying, and the, hap the happy mind is easily concentrated. The happy mind easily absorbs into samadhi. So it's not the other way around. Normally we think, once I get my samadhi together, then I'll be happy. What it, the way it actually works according to the Buddha in the suttas is when I get my happiness together, then I'll get my samadhi. So that's very important. Um, the happy mind is easily concentrated. Once there's samadhi, then it goes on to the next step, which is yata bhuta jnana dasana, which is knowledge and vision of things as they are. And then from yata bhuta jnana dasana is a, a quality arises called viraga or dispassion. And from viraga arises uh, a quality called nibida and nibida is the exact precursor to liberation so nibida is translated as world weariness usually but it's an incredibly bright and incredibly wholesome quality and nibida is right after nibida is vimuti is liberation so uh that's how it that's how it goes on from happiness it goes on it goes from happiness knowledge and vision of things as they are dispassion world weariness and liberation so that's that's how that progression goes thank you Ajahn. Uh, it, it, it relates to another question i wanted to ask you before i i, I open it up and that was um when you say that we are constructing a mental ed edifice i take it liberation is from that mental ed edifice but who are we in that i mean what do you mean when you say we are constructing the, what is this we you're referring to well we you know we have to use conventional language here so so we as in you know you and me us you know it's like a, uh on an ultimate sense there is no we there is no uh i wouldn't say the buddha never said in the suttas there is no self i mean that's implied he said all things are not self he did say that, um, uh, but we want to be clear that um, it's not a doctrine of no self. Uh, the Buddhist viewpoint is all things are not self, 
Um, and even Nibbana, he also said Nibbana is not self. Um, so, but I'm just saying, you know, we as an, in a conventional sense, you know, we, we have to <laughs> talk to each other somehow. Um, or we, you know, uh, we could say the illusory sense of self. Um, but uh, I would say it's just a, it's just a manner of, of speaking. Um, when we're talking about liberation too, the Buddha's talking about, he's reframing everything. So with liberation, with Vimuti, uh, Ajahn Chah talked very beautifully about this as well, because it's not easy to talk about when you're starting to talk about ultimate reality. There's all words, of course, fall short. But Ajahn Chah would break down the word Vimuti, and he would compare it to the word Somuti, which is conditioned. Vimuti is freedom from the conditioned or, or realization of the unconditioned. Some of some some sorry somuti is the uh, conventions is conventionality we could call it, we could translate that as conventionality and vimuti being liberation or uh, no longer being bound by the conventions. So uh, kind of the when the mind is in somuti the mind is affected by that. Um, it, in a way, it is that. In a way, it is the con it, it is the conventions. You could you could kind of say that. And the mind that is liberated, um, the conventions then no longer apply. There's like a separating out. But um, I can't say I can't say so much more about that other than the we is it's within the realm of the somuti. It doesn't apply in the vimuti. But could you say that the mind without conventions is being trapped by the mind with conventions would that be how you would express it uh well no because um that's when it gets difficult to talk about because the mind without conventions can't be trapped by anything it's originally pure um it can't it it can't it was never born and can never die so uh, and and it, uh yet there is a sense of awareness there it's unbounded awareness in itself as well so you can't you can't say that it it is trapped in something but you can say there is like there's clouds or obscurations veiling the realization of that reality um, yeah you could you could say that and that's so, the that's the conventional world so just to finish that off if if so when you say you know, we can feel a construction and we can, we can feel the, the possibility of being free from it. Is that a reference to that other mind? Because what is feeling that obstruction? <laughs> you, you, you're, still, uh, you're still left yeah. with the issue. It's not, right? I realize conventionally one uses the term we, but there is actually well, that feeling. Well, uh, you know, that's, that's where the Dhamma gets more profound. In, in a sense, we are that construction. So uh, it's not it's not just like we're in this con construct um, as a separate entity in a construct, but but we we as we think of ourselves and as we design ourselves are this construct. But then getting out of getting out of it, that's that's a profound aspect of dhamma. So that's vimuti, mm. um, that's emptiness. That's that's the ultimate reality that we're all looking for is the goal of Buddhism. Um, that's Nibbana. But uh, um, the Buddha, he never, you know, we're always, and, and myself as well, like looking for like, what is it? You know, wanting to define it. And um, that's the profound aspect is by its very nature, it can't be defined or, or pinned down. Um, this is where the whole balance between, this is where the the balance of the view comes in or, or right view. Um, the balance of the view is that it it's neither eternalism nor nihilism. Is the mind something that lives forever? That's that's eternalism. That's the soul, some the spirit, something that lives forever. That would be dubbed as eternalism. Nihilism would be when the body dies, that's it, oblivion. Um, so 
the Buddha said, well, with neither eternalism nor nihilism, there's the middle way, the Majima Patipada. And that's the, <clears throat> when the, in the time of the Buddha, they had, so, so in Western philosophy, we have something called the dilemma, which is, do I exist or do I not exist? Essentially, that's, that's the Western form of eternalism and nihilism. Do I exist or do I not exist? Mm -hmm. And so that's the big question. Philosophies are made around this. In Indian philosophy, in the time of the Buddha, they had what's called the quadrilemma, which is, do I exist or do I not exist? Or do I both, not, both exist and not exist? Or do I neither exist nor not exist? So that's the quadrilemma. So according to Indian philosophy, every, every doctrine had to fall into one of those four. So when the Buddha is asked by these Brahmins who are skilled in their philosophies, they say, the Buddha, after the breakup of the body, after death, does he exist? And the Buddha says, does not apply. And they say, does he not exist? And the Buddha says, does not apply. He said, does, does the Tathagata both exist and not exist? He says, does not apply. Does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist? And he says, does not apply. So they say, well, you must be an idiot, you know, because that everything has to fall into one of those four. And the Buddha said, well, you're, you're thinking of things in, in the wrong way. So um, he says, let me ask you a question. Uh, when you have a can, say you have a candle and the candle is your mind and you blow the flame out, um, where did the flame go? And does he say, did it go to the north? Does not apply. East, west, south, does not apply. And then the Buddha says, well, how would you term that flame? Uh, and then he says, well, the flame is simply termed as having gone out. And so the Buddha says, yes, that's, that's what you say about the mind of the Buddha after death, after the break of the body, it's gone out. So he says, uh, and then he says, you can't say it doesn't exist, but everything you could reference it by no longer applies. So that, that's like the phraseology in the suttas. And then the Buddha has verses where he says, uh, the mind of an enlightened one is deep and unfathomable like the great ocean. So it has a beautiful aspect to it as well. And, um, but, but then he, he does make a point of saying, you can't say it doesn't exist um, because uh, there might be a sense of like, oh, the Buddha's gone. The Buddha's mind attained liberation and he's gone, but that's, that's nihilism. So that's, that's, a, a, that's a, a taint of the view. That's a non-perfection of view. Or if you say like, well, the mind lasts forever. We were, we were reborn since beginningless time in samsara, so the mind is eternal. But that's eternalism. So because the mind doesn't, uh, the mind was never born. The, we're talking about the liberated mind. It was never born. And so you can't say it lasts forever because that implies existence. So uh, it's like, the, in terms of the view, it's like we, the Buddha is having us reframe things. He's saying, don't even think in those terms. Just think there is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is a cessation of suffering. There is the path leading to the cessation of dukkha, and that's enough. Um, that's what the Buddha is teaching. The Buddha is teaching how to how to stop dukkha, and he and all of his teachings are about how dukkha arises and passes away. All of his teachings fall in in that. Um, he did say he claimed that he realized many more things other than that. And that's when we come into the, the handful of leaves where he picks up the handful of leaves one day in the forest and says, monks are the leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest floor more. And the monks say, well, the leaves in my hand or the leaves in your hand are less the leaves on the forest floor. There's no comparison. And the Buddha did say, well, what I've realized when I got enlightened was as much as the leaves on the forest floor, but what I teach is like the leaves in my hand because all those leaves on the forest floor, they're not conducive to liberation. Yes, there, there was a realization and an insight into many things. Probably, you know, we can speculate the origins of the universe or whatever. Um, but uh, 
the leaves in the hand, that's what's conducive to liberation. And that's the Four Noble Truths. And so that's what the Buddha taught. And so we really want to know what were the leaves on the forest floor, because it would be so interesting to know all of that. Mm. And uh, we wish the Buddha could have just told us. And um, But uh, he said, no, that's that'll just distract you from what's really important. So... Uh... <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Ajahn. I'm going to hand you back to Wamanok and ask the next question. Yeah, um, I actually had a personal question about speech and how language um, creates or constructs our reality. And we're seeing that more and more. And I'm wondering how that ties into right speech, um, because there seems to be something very profound about right speech. And yet, when we communicate, we're using language to create a sort of reality obviously i'm trying to communicate something to you but that doesn't seem sublime in a way i mean i'm trying to transmit something but could you speak about the difference between just sort of conventional speech and how language creates our reality and then um right speech yeah yeah right speech it's it's really all for um surrounding ourselves with with goodness so there's complete non-remorse there's a sense of safety um on a course level you could say uh being very truthful and honest never telling a lie for any reason whatsoever um then never telling a lie is very freeing because then the truth always sticks up for itself you don't have to be mentally burdened by trying to protect a story or you know remember what you said before so that you need to like uphold it and uphold the the lie or the dishonesty or whatever so this like this sense of like brutal honesty is very freeing and um it's again it's not easy because sometimes like we might we might get in trouble or something if we're if we're honest about whatever and, or like we might be feel pressured into uh a little bit dishonest or trying to hide our actions somehow. Um, so there's different levels of such a barami of, of truth. But if we just use honest speech, that that in itself is very takes a lot of burdens off the mind and we don't even then we don't have to think about it. Oh, are they gonna find out? Are they gonna tell somebody else? Or and then like not using so the right speech is fourfold. It's the not lying, not doing a harsh speech not uh, doing divisive speech and, and refraining from idle chatter. And so that's what the Buddha said, so fourfold purification of speech. So like harsh speech, I mean, just not speaking out of anger. So like when the energy of anger arises, it's training ourselves to, if we speak out of anger, the result can't be good. According to the Buddha's teachings on karma, The if we speak out of anger, then then the result from that can't can't be wholesome. It can't. There can't be a good result from that. Uh, on the flip side, speaking out of metta, out of goodwill, the result has to be good because of the intentionality there. So the intention is the kama. The kama created is based on the intentionality. So if we speak out of anger, the speech is all. It's it's like what type of intention are we speaking from? That's that's what the right speech is about. So the Buddha talks about harsh speech. He says not speaking from anger, but only speaking words of goodwill, words of kindness, and so on. And then he goes into divisive speech, and he says like not delighting in divisiveness. So we might we might want to, you know, this this happens in in groups and communities when there's divisive speech, then wanting to divide one person from another or sow discord in order to so you can maybe um, get some sort of achieve some sort of aim or something so it's like divisive speech is sowing discord people who were harmony harmonious before uh using divisive speech to make them not be harmonious and the buddha defines this as going to person a and saying oh you know what person b said about you 
and then going to person B and saying, oh, you know what person A said about you and, and sowing discord in that way. And then the Buddha said, on the flip side, you should be training in the intention of delighting in concord, delighting in healing disputes, delighting in uh, bringing those who are divided back together, causing them to see each other's good qualities. And that's, that's extremely good, extremely wholesome and, and retraining yourself to delight in that. And then idle chatter, um, we might be able to argue that idle chatter is actually necessary. You know, you need to kind of hang out and talk about nothing in particular, you know, in order to just have relationships with people. Um, so, uh, but then the Buddha defined idle chatter as speech, which is utterly pointless. So, you know, if we're talking about the weather or something, there is some point to that. It's not, it doesn't completely qualify as idle chatter, but it's more like just, just speech that has no real usefulness is pointless. Um, you know, if we, if we get too much into, um, too playful or joking around too much, it can, it can go in the direction a little bit of wrong speech in terms of dishonesty as well. Um, or like making fun of others, you know, this can be, this can become problematic and uh, it can bleed into the other types of speech. I like the, the teachings on the 10 courses of unwholesome action when it talks about idle chatter. Um, it says that uh, idle chatter is not that bad of comma. It's like, it's just like little tiny drops of bad comma, but it becomes heavy because we're doing it all the time. And so based on quantity, then uh, it can it can become problematic. So, so then the Buddha said to retrain yourself to just speak what is uh, going to be cherished, speak what is beneficial, um, speaking what's going to be helpful, speaking at the right time, and and otherwise uh, training ourselves to keep silent and being comfortable with silence. A lot of idle chatter comes from not being comfortable with just abiding in silence and uh, being able to be around people. Uh, silent, uh, being able to have friend, Dhamma friends who are fellow meditators and you, you meditate with each other, but you're not, you're not talking, but you do develop a very wholesome relationship in that way. And so, uh, so yeah, speech, um, that's like the four courses of, of speech. Thank you. <coughs> I'm going to turn to a couple more questions that we have in the chat box. Um, this is from uh, Celia. Ajahn Naniko, what if you're surrounded by people who do not follow the five precepts, but have aspects of wrong speech, like harsh, harsh speech or lying, almost as a value? I can see how it may drag me down, but it's impossible to leave my society for the time being. Time for formal meditation is very limited, and I think my daily awareness advances really slow as my habits are so entrenched. Do you have any advice? Well, uh, during during the beginning of the question, I was going to say, get out of that situation. But then the next part of the question was, but I can't get out of that situation. <laughs> 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 <But> <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, the, the best one can do sometimes is just to be a good example. And um, we can think about the Buddha and nobody could match the Buddha. The Buddha was, uh, the Buddha was more developed than anybody else. And so, so he had to live in the society still and perhaps be surrounded by um, not so, not so good energies or influences sometimes. Um, it can also become a reflection on different realms of existence. We can we can develop equanimity through reflecting on kama, reflecting on that others are the owners of their kama, um, and in ways, in a very passive way, we can actually, if we're holding precepts and if we're surrounded by individuals such as this, then we can actually become kind of secretly become a good influence on them, and it may not be perceptible at first, but um, I always like to give the example of a uh, friend, a good good friend who um, works for Chevron 
corporation and um, the one of the higher ups uh, is superior it's a very very uh, she she's someone who just like her whole life is the corporation has no family or, or anything but uh, is very very kind of harsh with the workers sometimes and, and drives them very hard and he was wondering what to do about this. Should he quit? Cause he's gained faith in, in Buddha Dhamma. Should he quit Chevron? Should he not work for the corporation or whatever? And my thought was, no, you can be like a Dhamma mole in the corporation. And so, um, because that's his livelihood and he's got a family he's got to look after. He can't just quit a, a good well-paying job like that. So, um, so then I said, well, next time she tells you off, just, just take a deep breath, like don't react right away. Just take a deep breath and develop a sense of ease, set that motivation for developing a sense of ease. And so then didn't see him for a while. He came back to the monastery later on. He said, Hey, I, you know, I, I tried that. I, I developed a, a sense of ease. And, um, and then she approached me and said, um, why are you so at ease? Like, why are you, why didn't you react? Like when, you know, why were you, well, essentially, why are you treating me so kindly? And, um, and then that gave him an opening to say, well, I've, you know, I've been practicing this meditation thing and, and I go to this monastery and, and then uh, sometime later, she asked him for a Dhamma book and he brought her a, a Dhamma book and that, that uh, gave her like an opening. So I was quite proud of that, of that whole situation. Um, interestingly, now much time has passed. This was maybe a couple of years ago that this happened. And she's actually quit now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know why. I don't know why she quit. But uh, yeah, um, you never know. You never know what's going to happen with the Dhamma. So, so it's, just, it's just being a good example for people and being firm in the precepts, not, not buying into strong speech and being like, well, you know, if people see anger and uh, harsh speech and stuff as a virtue, then just being, being willing to say like, well, I'm, you know, this is just my thing. I'm, I'm, I'm into this whole like precept thing and this is just my thing. And I'm just, this is just what I'm doing. Being able to just say that and, and, uh, that's about, sometimes that's the best you can do, but also setting the motivation, like um, based on Buddha Dhamma Sangha, when the time is right, you know, may, may something else arise for me that's like more of a wholesome situation. If you set that motiva motivation, then something, something has to open up at some point because the motivation directs our path or direction in life. So, um, so it can also, things can also change, get better. Thank you all so much, especially to Venerable Ajahn Yanoko. Um, we are at 11 o'clock and uh, just to observe the monastic rules of eating, I don't want to take more of this precious time, but um, we are so delighted that we were able to hear from you Ajahn and to um, just learn from experience and to share in wise reflection um, on this Saturday and Thank you all for joining us. And if you'd like to make an offering, um, please go to abigiri.org. I put that in the chat box. And my apologies that we weren't able to finish all of the questions. Um, we had a couple more questions, but because of time, we weren't able to get to them. And um, I'd like to also share with you that next month, um, because I did ask Ajahn Amaro for um, another speaker for December, um, he recommended Ajahn Suchito uh, from England. And so he will be speaking on um, the topic of embodied Dhamma. So um, please stay tuned for that. It'll be sometime in December and I will send out a message to all of you. Again, thank you and my deepest respects to Ajahn Yanako for today's uh, wise reflection. Thank you so much. Great seeing everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.